Welcome back to Let Us Think About It. I'm writer Richards. We're finishing out Richard Sennett's The Culture of the New Capitalism today, and I hope you enjoy the show. So, an assassin, a ghost, and a zombie walk into a capitalist bar. Yeah. And in there, they're accosted by a marketing agent who says, please allow me to introduce myself. Naturally, this marketing agent immediately sees that the assassin, this kind of John Wick type, he's all surly, wearing an expensive suit and all this stuff. He really has no regard for humans beyond their transactional value. And of course, having given up this anchor of caring about human life, he became untethered from his community, history, or really much of anything, except for like cute puppy dogs and muscle cars, really likes those, and pencils. He's got this weird thing about pencils. The marketing agent says, I can see you are a man of wealth and taste. To the ghost, the marketing agent sees that this transparent thing, without a shadow, was once a person with dreams and desires, but has somewhere along the way lost the ability to do anything except for bitch and moan. And of course, without agency, without the ability to really affect real-world change, the spectral apparition became much like a leaky faucet, just one more thing that we all work really hard to ignore, but is really annoying. And of course the marketing agent says, I too have been around for long, long years. And finally he turns and he focuses on the zombie, this sinewy monster driven by this ravenous lust for brains. And he realizes this fast, shallow creature, no, no, dear listener, this isn't one of those shambling zombies. This corpse is lighter and faster without all that morality and pontification. This creature, with no morality and only consumptive desire, is a materialist who mistakes consuming brains for having brains. Well, this ironic tragedy is a perfect expression of the simplified capitalist mindset. It's all hunger and confusion. A cannibal who can never be sated, jealously wanting to consume life. And here, confronted by the trio, the marketing agent says, What's confusing you is the nature of my game. So this marketing agent. Let's think of maybe Jake Gyllenhaal's character Mysterio in the 2019 Spider-Man movie. I control the truth! Mysterio is the truth! Maybe mix that with some Mad Men and Cambridge Analytica. Yeah, we once had bad guys like Lex Luthor, not marketing directors, right? But instead industrial baron tycoons, these kind of financial people who made ghosts of men with their factories and offshoring. And then we end up having these Javier Bardem-type bad guys, where in this James Bond show as uh, Raul Silva, he's trained and talented, and of course he's out for revenge, and that involves this kind of terroristic toppling of the world order. Uh, Yeah, so the terrorist is a bad guy. Now, the villain usually has some sort of ideology, but the motivations are usually recognizably human, while the sacrifices they're willing to make are monstrous. Then we see Bardem as Anton Chigurh in No Country for Old Men. This is the assassin who has a bizarre ethical code, these kind of notions of fate that actually make him completely unrelatable, and that makes him infinitely more scary, infinitely more other. This is the best I can do. God. So the reverse of all this unrelatable otherness from these other bad guys, it's the terror of other, right? Well, this new bad guy, the marketing agent, the creative director, This one actually knows your desires. He knows your wishes and can manipulate at scale. This agent, like a virus, can infest, he can incept, and he can grow the goals of others in the masses. This person is all superficiality and appearances. They're all data and spin and con. Maybe he's an up-and-coming assassin, right? Maybe he's a ghost maker and an exorcist at the same time. Maybe he's a soon-to-be zombie maker. He's all potential. And maybe, like the superstitious fear of the camera capturing your soul, maybe we have been giving away fractions of our soul with each password. And we too have become untethered and vulnerable. We now live in gray scales of commingled good and evil, where all the sinners are saints. We're in a time of relative personal truths, where all heads are tells. And the marketing agent says, I hope you guessed my name. Part 1. Is the culture of the new capitalism and our capitalist economy creating a new politics? Well, yes, of course. 
In the past, our politics was driven by inequality. And that was really the changing force that drove it forward, and it furnished the reasons for change. Yet today, inequality is being reconfigured through wealth and work. So what that means is that there's a divide between the wealthy workers who are, as Robert Reich calls them, the skills elite. Well, these elite are the symbolic analysts who have cleaved themselves from the stagnant middle class. So that's really like kicking that pesky kid off the ladder as you climb up to success. Suck it, kid. Your broken legs will heal in six weeks. Well, yeah, actually, that's a bit harsh. I mean, it's not like we can really blame anyone for wanting to be an elite, right? But we can get mad when they pull the ladder up behind themselves. These achievers, these skills elite, Senate says the new institutional model, the workplace, does not provide them with a life narrative or a promise of security in the public realm. In their network society, their informal networks are actually quite thin. So for us, this is the skilled assassin, right? There's no history, there's no life narrative, there's no security. And with a life of transactions, you end up with a very thin network because it's only transactional value. I mean, it's what can you do for me right now? So if you break your leg, nothing, right? This is not the rich familial or community networks that would pull together to help you just because of who you are. You've given that self up when you kick the kid off the ladder. And this is where the work translates into politics. As mentioned in the last episode, a successful capitalist technocracy will need fewer and fewer elites to run it efficiently. Yet, as these elites take home the dragon's share of wealth, there's avatars nesting in beds of Bitcoin, the inequality becomes increasingly visible. It produces resentment. So, resentment is beyond resentment, really, or hostility. As Nietzsche may say, it's beyond good and evil. It is really a social feeling of playing by the rules and yet being patronized, not being dealt with fairly. And seeing internal enemies steal prizes, both social and economic, to which they have no right. And really, you're unable to act when all this happens, and this often leads to you being humiliated. Under this deep rage, Senate says, religion and patriotism become weaponized tools of revenge. So, yeah, the material stress of inequality pushes those without into seeking symbolic power. As progress has failed them, the once left center worker moves to the right. So progress fails, let's go backwards. So they move into romantic conservatism, in which their role and their agency, their ability to enact change, is somehow blended with nostalgia for things that were once better, in a world in which they could actually have meaning. Now, seeing the obvious divide from the elites and being shaken off the ladder, what role is really left? Have the masses just really kind of turned into these whining ghosts and they're just out haunting Facebook and trolling institutions? Well, no. <laughs> at least I hope not. But let's take a closer look at that. The Walmart's effect. In 2004, Walmart employed 1.4 million workers generating 2% of U.S. GDP. How did they do it? Well, they made this huge box, and they filled it with aisles of smaller boxes. Genius, right? Oh, oh man, I think now what I want to do is make an even bigger box and fill it with even more smaller boxes. You know what? And then we're going to get box trucks to send these boxes to people. Uh, oh, Amazon, damn it. Ugh. So anyway, when I walks into the Walmarts, I got everything under one roof. Toilet paper and light bulbs and dog food and DVD players and of course 43 kinds of potato chips. But here I am today deciding on underwear. Don't want the kind that protects my junk or the kind that enhances my junk. Ooh, so where's the, uh, where's the salesperson, right? Oh, right, it's Walmarts. No salespeople. No middlemen, no one to help me make decisions, no experts to offer advice, it's just me. And I get all my advice from the packaging. I mean, the advertising, right? And of course, naturally, I pick the package that will enhance my package. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, and because it's so cheap, I won't even need to wash them, right? I'm just going to throw them away. Kind of like my computer printer, which it's really just cheaper to buy a new one than buying ink again. So, and then I, you know, because I have to print out some more pictures of me in my new sexy undies yeah, for the ladies. Hmm. So, whatever. I can get everything in this place. I can work here. I can get food. I can change my oil. I can get glasses. 
I can buy drugs in the parking lot. Like, whatever, right? I can vote here at the Walmarts. Wait, no, not yet, but close. I'm pretty sure we will soon. And of course, I know how to make my decisions about these votes, right? Because I see two shiny packages. One is red, one is blue. They're using words probably dreamed up by a global marketing firm, by some distant creative director. Mm, aha, who knows, Mysterio? Ah, but this person would know that I need to save money and look good. And of course, there's a deadline. The store is closing and you gotta vote. And really, you know, who cares anyway? If it doesn't work out, I'll just buy another politician next time. So this is perhaps, of course, a bit flippant and simple. But as Sinnott says, just as advertising seldom makes things difficult for the customer, so the politician makes him or herself easy to buy. And this is the Walmart effect. And yes, while Walmart has certainly oppressed its workers and destroyed small businesses, well, really nothing in this world is entirely that simple because it also serves a real purpose. As Sinnott says, only a snob could look down on cheap products. Should we then look down on cheap politics? The political version of the megastore could repress local democracy, but enable, as advertising does, individual fantasy. Erode the content and substance of politics, but stimulate the imagination for change. Voting. Now, back to voting at Walmart. A classic idea from the Athenians. Separate your economics from your politics. I think we can agree on that. Plato says that economics operates on need and greed, while politics should operate on justice and right. But we've increasingly put it all under one roof, and it's also done so very far away. Local politics and local media are all but gone. It's all national news channels now in Capitol Hill. Now, as Marx and Engels discuss... As the consumer becomes a distance from the means of production, we lose the knowledge and life experience to make informed decisions. All that's left is to rely on the packaging, to rely on the marketing filtered messages and, I mean, really, aren't you kind of tired after a hard day's work? I mean, you're so busy in the economic realm, let us just handle the political imagineering for you. Because yes, economics and politics should be separate, but when the local entities have disappeared, well, the means of production for your politics is no longer traceable. Politics is now manufactured elsewhere, out of sight, and shipped to us. We just need to decide if we want our package protected or enhanced. Desire. Have you seen Slavoj Žižek's little diatribe on desire through Coca-Cola? Basically, a Coke looks amazing. It's really only fun kids in the commercials and they're all dancing and drinking it. And, or, or maybe there's polar bears drinking it, right? But either way, the idea is that you're really commanded to enjoy. Fulfill yourself. Enjoy the real thing. Coke. So this is all desire and excess. And yet, even as you purchase a Coke and you begin to open it, it's already not living up to the desire, the feelings that you just had. Equally, there's no flashing lights, thumping music, or some cool kid on a skateboard with neon leggings going by. I, I don't know. But basically, your first sip, you know, it's fine. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's sugary, right? Um, but by the third sip, it's starting to warm up. It's not as fizzy, and your desire really hasn't been fulfilled. And you figure out that, I don't even really like Coke. Why did I just buy this? And maybe I really want something else. What else do I want? Maybe, maybe a Pepsi. I know. Yeah, I'll take a Pepsi. <laughs> a desire is never simply a desire for a certain thing, says Zizek. It's always a, a desire <laughs> for desire itself. The ultimate melancholic experience is the loss of desire itself. So to be fulfilled is the saddest world that we could imagine. So Marx, Lukacs, and Balzac... Oh, what an awful name. Well, they all talked about desire through capitalism and talked about how capitalism would produce an increase in desire. More cheap stuff equals more desire. Yet this really doesn't explain this other problem. There has been a withering of pleasure in possession. We own more than ever, yet we only want more and we're not happy with what we have, right? So is this a contradiction or what? Once shoes were handed down and mended for generations, 
now we have closets full of shoes that we wouldn't even wear. So one claim is that marketing did this to us. It molded our desires. As if we were somehow some sort of silly, ravenous zombies and they just painted the word brains on a box and we went, and went ran towards it, right? Another claim is that planned obsolescence did this to us, right? Got us into this pattern of buying. And this goes back to the computer printer where it's cheaper to buy a new computer printer than buy the ink. So they made the products of such low quality that they would deteriorate or force new purchases upon us, right? So there's been a break in how we relate to commodities. All objects are now disposable, newer is better, and we seek novelty beyond functionality. Now, none of this is to imply that we can or should return to the old ways of doing things, right? I mean, the cat is out of the bag, so to speak, with desire unleashed. This is merely a way to see that appearances and the symbolic function at a much higher level than utility or need. Branding. Sinnott points out a distinction. Branding is pretty straightforward, and it attempts to make something seem distinct, right? Yet most of the time the product is actually blandly identical to other products, and it's really just done to sort of disguise the homogeneity of all things, so you end up making an artificial distinction in branding. I recently made three art pieces, and they're all identical pretty much, except for the coloration. And this is based on a little bit of researching into tool manufacturing, where these three objects likely came out of the same factory, and despite the drastic price differences, they could only boast very small differences. And of course, most of this just came down to the branded color they were painted with. And of course, at the time, I was joking with myself that I would sell these for the same amount as the branded tools, right? If you want the white one, it's $900. If you want the gold one, it's $2,200. Now, Senate says manufacturers actually call this gold plating. And branding actually does this. The small difference and the brand must seem to the consumer to be more than the thing itself. So basically, a car or computer may have like 90% of the same industrial DNA with another car or computer. But for some reason, one of these might sell for 100% difference in price. And this is, of course, manufactured value through gold-plated differences, marketed differences. And the difference between something like a Kia and a Volkswagen, or even a Kia and a Porsche, they don't really align with the price tag. Can a Porsche go 10 times faster than a Kia? No, right? Because that would be going like a thousand miles an hour. Maybe it goes twice as fast, but for some reason it doesn't cost twice as much. Now, Senate brings up that the craftsman or engineer, they may look at this problem, and they may not be swayed by the gold plating, and they can just realize the thing has a certain utility value, and that's how they're gonna judge it, right? That thing does what that thing should do, and that's the kind of value behind it, versus this kind of inflated prestige value. And the reason here would be that perhaps they're aware of the backstory. This craftsman has been studying things, and they understand what led to the product. Now, remember how Marx said that we're actually divorced from the means of production? Well, we could, of course, research all these products, but I think generally, this misses the point. The point is more subtle, and it's kind of about our transformation due to capitalism and branding, our behaviors and our habits, and how we consume. Guy Debord brings up that tourists travel from city to city, but they visit the same gift shops after buying pretty much the same crap in each location, and the important stimulation for them is not actually the items bought. It's the process of moving, of moving on. This is the planned obsolescence of experience. To be consuming them and then getting new experience is the desire. The important thing is the spectacle. To shift your desire is to change. It's to feel yourself shifting, right? Now this allows a type of consumer participation because there's this idea of the half-finished frame that you get to fill in. So you think of this kind of insipid tourist photo ops, right? Where you go stand in front of some dumb letters or you stick your head inside of a wooden hole. I think we've all done it. Um, and what happens here is we're energized by our own movement and our incompleteness and we're getting to fulfill this thing, right? So we are the gold plating in this scenario. We step in and we become that small difference that we overvalue. So our commodity fetishism through fulfilling desire and becoming our own gold plating, this is for us to be in constant movement and a new spectacle. It is a self-consumptive habit and along the way we end up abandoning everything else. It was made to be disposed of anyway, right? Yeah, so what Senate brings up several times 
is this invitation to imagination that advertising promotes in us. And of course, to sneer at somebody imagining a better future, a new politics, and a shared fantasy for change, well, that would be callous indeed. I mean, where would we be without imagination? Citizen Consumer Today, the consuming passion has a dramatic power. Possessive use is less arousing to the spectator consumer than the desire for the thing he does not yet have. The dramatization of potential leads the spectator consumer to desire things he cannot fully use. Politics is equally theatrical, and progressive politics in particular requires a certain kind of rhetoric. It deploys a willing suspension of disbelief of citizens and their own accumulated experience. So that's a little quote from Senate. So stick with me on this one. I think it's pretty good. But uh, basically, the consumer spectator citizen, he now actively enters his own passivity or her own passivity. To believe in hope and change, you have to imagine a future. So you have to temporarily suspend your accumulated life experiences, your belief in those. And you have to want something that you don't yet have. Now, the problem is the illusions that we're fed as consumers, the dramatized potential that we can't even use. An example of this would be something like a Land Rover, right, built for four-wheeling out in the desert, and yet it only sits in bumper-to-bumper traffic. And of course, we imagine that the potency of the Land Rover will be conferred upon us, even though we never leave the road. So these illusions become exhausting, and paradoxically, they are often undercut by our own lived experience. Whenever crappy products are promised something, and they fail, and then we correlate that also with crappy politics. And this ends up draining us of our progressive hope and our stamina for change. So much like the car example, we could even take this into like a Ford Chevy debate where our political platforms are also product platforms. The political parties sound very different, but it's all gold plating for very small differences. It's all user-friendly, and there's almost always a new product and an upgrade for sale, right? And maybe a new face. And once politicians are in office, Senate brings up how they perform almost identically. Righty Reagan, for instance, this guy ran up Keynesian deficits while expanding bureaucracy and befriending the Soviets. This is not in the Republican playbook. Meanwhile, lefty Bill Clinton, he grew businesses, but not the minimum wage. That's not very leftist. And just like Obama, he continued military actions. Right, left, Chevy, Ford, psh, the difference is just superficial. It's really just consensus politics. The real change has been, just like businesses who centralize power and claim the workers have autonomy, while they somehow increase distance and precarity through vague edicts, Well, the state also has started doing the same exact thing. They have centralized their power, and then they just back off, and they watch the citizens instead of leading. They're reactive to what citizens do, and when something goes wrong, they refuse to take responsibility for the citizens. It's all laissez-faire citizenship. Meanwhile, this gold plating, this theatrical spectacle of inflating small differences, it's performing this kind of symbol inflation, and this is supposed to be distracting us. They use rhetoric and they highlight individual character traits of politicians, and this is all just to sort of mask that consensus platform that actually this is all the same thing. So what we're offered is all packaging, it's all reality television, and of course you all already know this, and this is just where they choose the cast that can put on the best show for us. Now, interestingly, if you were a citizen craftsman, you would really be, or like an engineer here, you'd be jumping into the use. So, for instance, no one really seems to care about a politician's record while they're in office. I mean, that's just too boring. Instead, let's focus on their hair, their tastes, their preferences. Boxers or briefs, Bob. The gold plating tendency is really what Freud called the narcissism of small differences, in which we lose realistic value and perspective, we lose the purpose of what's at stake. And this opens a door to preference judgment, and that easily extends into prejudice. Remember earlier when I was talking about how citizen has turned from progress, and now we kind of actively enter our own passivity? Well, this is how it works, right? We ignore the difficult political issues we disengage from them for the glitter of the charismatic personality the gimmicky packaging, because what this really is is discount shopping for politics. We believe the branding and believing the power that we confer upon that charismatic leader, just like that Land Rover, will somehow translate into potency for us. And in so doing, 
we make this huge mistake where we divorce power from responsibility. Charisma and packaging, they don't take responsibility when something goes wrong. They don't work for you, they manipulate you. As Senate says, the citizen craftsman though, this person doesn't fall prey very easily to the petty and the pretty, right? They would look at the use, they would dig in, they would make an effort to really figure out what's going on here and they'd get past all this shallow artifice. And that is, of course, why I started this podcast. To DIY my way into understanding a bit more, to dig in a bit deeper, maybe one day to be this kind of craftsman of ideas and politics of mind, all these kind of things. Yet, uh, it seems to be happening, there is an overload of information and that tends to prompt disengagement. We all sort of end up having to fall back on edited, interpreted communications, and we're unsure of whether or not we're still being manipulated by our desires. So what we really need, of course, is a community that's beyond superficial human connections to reassert mental and emotional anchors. We need thick networks. We don't want to become ghosts or zombies or hitmen, any of these kind of things. We need anchors to help us remain human. We need a culture that reassesses if power, privilege, and work are even worthwhile. And a culture that provides us with a narrative of forward movement that goes beyond the dehumanizing effects of the culture of the new capitalism. All right, thank you for your time. If you can't tell, I really enjoyed this text. Every paragraph has an amazing thought written in it, and it's very clearly written. So five stars, highly recommend. Uh, By the way, it has officially been one year since I started this podcast, and I think I may take a break for a while, recharge a bit, maybe reconsider where we're heading and at what pace this is going. Um, If you have advice for me, tell me what works, what doesn't, what your favorites may be. Uh, Please feel free to reach out and let me know at the website, uh, letusthinkaboutit.com. Until next time, stay safe.